Hey guys! So I finished a book recently and I'm gonna talk about it because I have many feelings about this book. And the book that I am talking about is Queen of Air and Darkness by Cassandra Clare. I usually don't do very many reviews with the exception of one that was kindly sent to me a while back as well as Lady Midnight by Cassandra Clare. I thought that I made one of Lord of Shadows but I guess I didn't. Um, I just made a bookstore vlog of me going to get it but I really wanted to make one for the last book in this series just so I can like round it out. I've made one for the first one so I might as well make one for the third one. But this review is going to be filled with spoilers. And so if you have not read the book, I don't recommend watching this unless you don't care about spoilers. But if you do, just go now. Please go now. I have many feelings about this book. They're good, they're kind of eh, like not so great, and I have a lot of questions as well. So that's kind of how I'm going to be breaking up this review for this video. And so I'm first going to start in with the good. So as with all of Cassandra Clare's books, I really admire her writing. Her type of writing is my most favorite type that I like to read and I kind of feel like my own writing falls under as well. It kind of has like that fairy tale-esque-ness to it. Um, not like necessarily telling a fairy tale but it has like that dream like feel to it and makes you feel like you're reading something super dramatic and you're really into it and there's like a sense of magic even if there necessarily isn't magic in it but although all of her books do. Also for this book in particular I really enjoyed the aspect of sprinkling in a bunch of illustrations throughout the novel that had to do with important scenes in the book and I gotta say that my most favorite one is probably the one with um, Sebastian, Jace, and Ash while Sebastian's sitting on his throne in Thule. It just looked really badass. I know they're supposed to be evil, but I just thought it looked really awesome and badass. Sandra Claire, you are stealing my Brandon, okay? For the longest time I've had the idea to write my own books and then kind of illustrate images throughout it. Not necessarily a graphic novel, but probably a little more images put into it than Queen of Air and Darkness has in it. So, Cassandra Clare, you stole my idea of a book that I haven't even written yet. Although, I mean, I, I technically am writing it, it's just not finished, not anywhere near being finished. I also really enjoyed the beginning of this novel. I had goosebumps throughout the entire first page, first chapter, and honestly, throughout the entire storyline of Livy's death and them going to the funeral and mourning her, I was like, feeling what they were feeling. Cassandra Clare does a really good job of getting the reader to feel what their, her characters feel. And also an aspect that I thought really added a lot to the whole dramatic uh, sadness to the beginning was the fact that Helen just showed up and she hasn't seen her family in so long since she's been in exile. And then she finally sees Livy. I think like um, I didn't reread Lord of Shadows before reading Queen of Air and Darkness, so I could be wrong here, but I think like she just shows up to uh, the clave, the the Halls of the Accords or whatever it's called, and she sees Livy. I'm not sure if she interacts with her, but she literally like sees Livy die, and she's like just been reunited with her. And so I thought that was really powerful, and just like a punch in the gut, and just really set the tone for the entire book. Also, like my window is open right now, and like I can hear people outside, and I'm like, please don't hear me like talking really loudly into my camera because this is the first time I'm using my Canon Rebel T6 instead of my usual camera that I use and so hopefully the sound is gonna be alright and hopefully it just like doesn't come out really crappy uh, so fingers crossed. Something that I always enjoy from Cassie Clare is the characters. The characters that I found really appealing and characters that I fell in love with even more um, were Julian, Christina, and also Mark and Julian, as well as Kit. Oh, Kit. <laughs> he is my son! He is a cinnamon roll. From the beginning, I was really scared that something was going to happen to Julian. Um, sorry also if I'm, like, just looking down throughout this entire video. I have my pages of notes that I'm going to be looking at. Um, so I don't get sidetracked. I was honestly so scared that Julian was going to do something and like sacrifice himself to save his family which it's 
known that his family is like the most important thing and like I just expected somebody to make like a huge sacrifice in this and if anybody would be doing that it is Julian and he kind of does that um, but it's like a personal sacrifice of his feelings like he makes all of his emotions go away and um, I really enjoyed that aspect of the storyline um, I kind of guessed it early on like when he went to Magnus's house I was like whoa whoa what's going on here like this is so sudden um, is he getting rid of like his emotions for Emma and that that's what happened. Julian also said my most favorite quote, I think, through in the book. And also, um, he was involved in one of like the most powerful scenes I feel like I've read in a long time. And so that was from... <laughs> and so I think this is from page 482 or 483. It's like one of those pages. And Julian says, I don't know if we'll be separated, but if we are, I'll think of what you just said and it will carry me through whatever happens. In the dark, in the shadows, in the times when I am alone, I will remember. Like, reading that, I was just like, I had so much pride for my child. And like, I'm saying he's my child, but also he's like my husband at the same time. It's a weird dynamic. Right after this quote is said, there's this like intimateness between him and Emma and they start like kissing and stuff but like as they are Julian is reciting the Parabatai bond like quote what they have to say to each other when they first get their Parabatai runes but like he's saying it with like a romantic feeling to it and it's just like it gave me chills and I loved it so much. It's probably like one of my favorite if not the f most favorite uh, scene in this book for me. And so along with Julian, I really enjoyed Christina's character. Uh, throughout all the books, I really enjoyed her character as well, and she has just this sort of like, like positivity about her, and everybody gravitates around her, and she's just very kind, sweet, and caring above all else. But she can also be really fierce and like a badass fighter when she needs to, and I really like that balance. Um, she's not just like this caring mother figure, but she can also like pack a punch when she needs to. And I like that she just doesn't have like. So guess whose camera only filmed 11 minutes when I filmed like an hour long video. <laughs> so. Um, I'm refilming this part of the video. I am like really upset that this happened because I spent like so long talking about this and I really liked what I said and hopefully this time I can, I don't know, reiterate what I said and just like, I don't know, like it as much as the other one turned out. Okay, so I was talking about Christina. So basically she's this really caring person, but she can also be an awesome fighter when she needs to be, and this is one of the reasons why Kieran and Mark fall in love with her. Um, I'm gonna touch on their relationship with her later on in this video. Along with Christina, I really enjoyed Mark and Kieran's character as well. I feel like Kieran had a lot of character development throughout this book, and for the good, and that just made me like him so much more. Another quote that um, I have written here, and so it's when Drew and Kieran are talking about like romance and their feelings, and um, and Drew says, "Don't remain silent about what you want, or you may never get it." And Kieran replies, "You are very wise," he says gravely, and Drew says, "Well, actually, I saw that on a mug," and Kieran's like mugs in this world are very wise. Like, I just love that line so much, and I just love that it comes from Kieran because, like, he's being sincere about it, even though he's, like, this super serious, like, fairy. It's like, he doesn't know how cute he's being, and it's so great. And so, next I want to talk about Kit. He is probably, like, my most favorite character out of this series. Maybe it's the fact that he's a Herondale, I don't know, he's just so likable because he's such a different character from the rest of the Shadowhunters. I know like we see Clary who starts off as like not knowing she's a Shadowhunter and then becomes one, but Kit is already like aware of Shadowhunters but he like hates them and so it's really interesting to see his progression of not liking any Shadowhunters to having like feelings for Ty and caring about these people that he's come to know. And so one of my favorite parts with Kit in this book is when he's talking to Jace 
and Jace asks him if he's decided to become a shadow hunter and Kit replies with what else would I be and that like really shows how far he's come and it's like one of my favorite lines in this book um, and just like I don't know I feel so proud of Kit in that moment like huh? and I know Jace feels a sense of pride as well and so I feel like that's all I have to say for the parts that I really loved. Of course I love different parts of this book as well, but those are just things that really stood out to me. And now for the parts that were kind of like, uh, and not so great. And even though I'm mentioning all of these things, I still gave the book like 4.5 stars. Um, I would give it a 5, but because of these things on my list that were not so great, I can't give it a full 5. And so to start off, there were way too many point of view changes. Well, I wouldn't say like the actual changes because I didn't mind hearing from different point of views. It was just the fact that it happened so frequently and so fast that we couldn't get to finish a full scene before it switched to, to another. And so I was watching Insane Reader's video, Caleb's video, about his review on this book as well and that was something that I really really agreed with and was like what I put in my notes originally and so I'm glad that he agreed with me on that as well and I just I just feel like it could have done better where I know like it was supposed to go chronologically and so that's why we had a bunch of the scene breaks but I feel like certain plot lines could have been handled differently specifically Kit and Ty's plot line where they're trying to resurrect Livy from the dead. I feel like it didn't need to take the length of the entire book because I it it's not like, I don't know. I feel like they could have done it a different way. I keep saying they, but like, I mean Cassandra Clare. I feel like she could have done it a different way where they didn't need to have the Mortal Mirror, the Lake Lynn as the catalyst um in order to resurrect Livy. I feel like they could have like I know this was mentioned where it was like at the where the sea started um, in LA and that could have been like a fine catalyst so I feel like their plot line could have been resolved earlier on and then we were able to like focus more on the more important storylines in order to like wrap up the book. I'm not saying like I didn't enjoy reading about Ty and Kit because they were like the characters that I really wanted to know a lot more about and I know that because they're gonna have like a like another series after this one that focuses more on them that we will get more of them in the future but I just kind of wish that we got more screen time of them but like different type of screen time like I feel like every time we cut to their scenes it was like the same thing like Kit didn't want Ty to do it but he did it anyway and Kit was gonna follow him because he loves him and he's like I know we shouldn't be doing this but I love Ty so like I gotta so this is like the most important thing that I felt like could have used more work and that was the ending so um, I kind of wish first of all that Cassandra Clare had a different ending um, instead of like having a marriage between Malik. Um, I'm not saying like I don't want them to get married or anything but like because I love Malik but I just wish that it didn't end in a similar ending to City of Heavenly Fire which also ended in a marriage. I mean I like Malik more than Jocelyn and Luke but um, I just feel like it could have been done a different way to make it to make it, it its own thing and not kind of like a copy of what she's already done. So I would say that this is my least favorite Cassandra Clare ending of her series. I wanted to cry and feel a bunch of feels and just be emotional and I didn't cry at all in the last few scenes. I was just like happy for all of the characters that like mostly everything was resolved even though I still have a lot of questions about those things and I just feel like it was kind of like anticlimactic with the Parabatai curse explanation. So for the entire series we're focusing on the Parabatai bond and we just get this like really brief and vague explanation from Jem and just like for having it be such an important plot line I would have thought that there would be more focus on it and I don't know like I feel like Cassandra Clare spent too much time focusing on character development and different plot lines instead of working to come up with like a really developed reason for the Prabhatite curse. I also think that it would have been interesting to see the outcome if 
Emma did succeed in striking her the sword through the Prabhatai rune in the Silent City. Like, it's set up so perfectly, like, they get the mortal sword, which was, like, unavailable up until this point from Thule, And I, I want to know, like, what Emma and Julian thought of becoming the gigantic Nephilim and, like, the pain that they felt. I know, I think, like, when they became the giant things, they were like, we're burning from the inside out. And I just wanted to see more of, like, the physical, like, repercussions of becoming those gigantic creatures. And I know, like, I guess they were healed by the, like, Irats runes or whatever, the healing runes. But it was just, like, a really quick thing that was glossed over and I just wanted to know more. And also, like, how did Drew know that Emma and Julian, like, were gonna go back to normal if, like, she gathered the whole family and just, like, told them all the reasons that they loved them? Like, it was really heartfelt, but it just kind of, like, was confusing and didn't really make sense as to how Drew knew. And I'm just wondering if we're gonna, like, find out in later books and also just the idea of becoming the true Nephilim. I want to know if we're gonna see that like possibly because I know like they talk about Prabhatai who have done it in the past so I want to know if there's gonna that's gonna happen in the last hour series that takes place kind of like in the Victorian times again. And so also like at the end, the very end when Emma and Julian finally get to be together in front of everybody there's the scene where they're like on the beach at Malik's wedding and they like finally had this like embrace and they kiss and it's like all happy and I just felt like it would have been more powerful if Cassandra Clare had written it where like they didn't have so many kissing scenes and embracing scenes throughout the entire book. Like, I know throughout the entire series, it's no secret. Even though it's forbidden, like, that doesn't stop them from, like, being with each other. And, like, literally Magnus is like, don't even think about each other. And then they go and, like, maybe one last kiss and it'll be fine. So I feel like that took away a little of the satisfaction of reading that final scene with them. And so I feel like if there was more of a separation throughout this last book, like, because of Julian's, um, like, taking away his emotions and also, like, the Prabhatai curse getting worse, that they would, like, stay away from each other more and just interact, like, through talking and stuff and be more at odds with each other because I feel like that would have added more to, like, the conflict of the Prabhatai bond and, like, it would have been so satisfying to see at the end them finally be with each other. That leads me into, like, that certain things were way too convenient. So... Julian at the beginning when they enter Fairy and they're like, we don't have the black volume, and then he kills like Dane or whatever his name is, and Julian's like, here it is, I do have it because I made a copy of it at Office Max. Like, like, I don't know, it it could have been done in a way where like it wasn't just like thrown in there. Like I know in Lord of Shadows there was like a brief mention that he like took it to Office Max or something like that. I feel like it was thrown in there that way just to further the plot and just to set up the entire book and I feel like it could have been done in a different way because it's like showing like we have been in his point of view before this moment and where he pulls out the book and when we're in his point of view like we don't get any knowledge that he has the book and it's kind of like it's hidden from the reader even though we're in his head and I just feel like it was put in there as like a surprise effect um, and I just felt like it was too convenient. Also, the blight and warlock sickness um, and how Emma and Julian are told how to stop it when they're in Thule. They were just being told the information, they didn't really like go and seek it out themselves and it just kind of like happened accidentally for them and I just feel like it was a little too convenient that was just thrown in there to further the plot because Cassandra Clare wanted to focus on different aspects and she needed to find a way to like get this part of it solved. 
And then also, as I briefly mentioned before, the Parabtai runes just get like randomly burned off and that's the only rune that gets burned off of Emma and Julian. Whereas like in City of Heavenly Fire, Jace is, is like engulfed in, in Heavenly Fire and he, none of his runes get burned off and I just... We don't even get an explanation of why they burned off. We get an explanation of the Prabhatai curse, even though it's like a little iffy in itself, but we don't even get to know why the runes burned off. Unless like it was thrown in there and I just like don't remember it. And also, so for being titled Queen of Air and Darkness, I would have thought Annabelle would have a larger role in this book, like more screen time. She died in the middle of the book. And then there was kind of like that random throw-in towards the end where like that demon is pretending to be her. And it's just like, it gets killed off really quickly as well. And I don't know, like, honestly, it should have been called Queen of Resurrecting Livy or like Morning Livy because I felt like it focused like a lot on Livy throughout the entire book and I feel like her death took over the book in not a great way. Like, I understand and I'm not complaining that, like, her family is going to mourn her and it's still fresh and so it's going to, like, take its toll on them and it's going to affect the things later on in this book. But especially with Ty and Kit resurrecting Livy, like, that plot line took way too long because every time it cut to them, we weren't getting anywhere until the very end, and it was kind of just dragging out way too long, and I feel like if it was resolved earlier on in the story, we could have focused more on the Parabatai curse and figuring that all out instead, and then we could have had more of the issues between Kit and Ty's relationship and stuff, and I guess, like, Cassandra Clare's gonna wait until the next series for all of that to happen, but I just feel like their plot line was dragged out way too long, even though I love seeing them, like, have screen time. Also, the demon that, going back to um, Annabelle, the demon that, like, pretends to be her, is that gonna have something to do with the next series? Because I feel like it was way too random, or I, I feel like it was way too important to just be a random thing that happened because it didn't get killed by Seraph Blades. In Fairy, they couldn't use their Seraph Blades, so I wonder if that's tied together and hopefully it'll come up in the next series or so because um, I feel like that would be a really interesting thing to explore. And so, Cassandra Clare, you really went and gave everybody a love interest. I am all for the ships. Like, whenever I read books, I'm always looking for some romance and some conflicts with relationships. And I know Cassandra Clare wants everybody to be happy, and honestly, they're my children. I want them to be happy too. But, like, they set it's set up like that Drew and Jamie, or like Drew and Ash are gonna be a thing in the new series, and then Diana and Gwen, which, like, I enjoyed. And I do enjoy the idea of Drew and her love interest, but was kind of. I don't know, like, it didn't need to be set up in this book. In City of Heavenly Fire, we see Emma and Julian and the family, and I, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think that there was any romantic coding that was really obvious to us that Emma and Julian were going to end up to each, with each other. I think at the time we knew that they were going to be the focus and that they were going to be together, but it wasn't actually written in the book, all this romantic stuff between them, and it allowed for the plot lines that were essential to City of Heavenly Fire to come into play. And I feel like if we got rid of more of this, like, romantic setup for the next series, we could have focused on a lot more important things to happen in this book and for it to get resolved. Even though this was a slight problem for me in this book, I actually am really interested to see the dynamic between Drew Ash and Jamie because all three of these characters are super interesting and different from a lot of the characters that are in the Shadowhunter world and because like Ash is super mysterious we don't know a lot about him except that he is this like likable person but that's because of like the stuff that was like done to him before he was born and Jamie's this really likable person in a different way and he has like a connection with Livy, or I mean with Drew, and I'm like just really looking forward to that 
love triangle in the upcoming series and I am honestly fine with Cassandra Clare's love triangles because they're done really well. Okay, um, but like going back to the love interest thing, so like at the end when Christina's like talking to her mom and her mom's like, you know, of course it would take two men to feel D to fill Diego's shoes and then like somebody's like, I don't think Diego minds and he's kind of like having a thing with Diva or Divio, whatever her name is. Really? You had to find a person for him too? I feel like it wasn't really necessary. Let people be single. Let somebody be sing single for once. And I just feel like it was Oprah. You get a love interest. You get a love interest. You get a love interest. So that leads me into the three-way relationship between Christina, Mark, and Kieran. So throughout the series, I really enjoyed Mark and Christina together and Kieran and Mark together as well. And I love all three of these characters individually. And it's definitely a fan service to have all three of them be together. And I'm not gonna lie, like, I am all for it just because I love all of these characters. The idea of like the relationship was done well on Cassandra Clare's part. The only thing that I think wasn't done well was the ending for them. Like it would have been perfect for them to just have it be Kieran becomes the Unseelie King and Mark and Christina are together and that's that. Or when Kieran is talking to his brother in, about like possibly being the king instead of him that would have made it so that Kieran could have like gone in between the normal world and fairy and be able to be with Mark and Christina and that would have been fine too but then there was them going to that cottage in fairy and being together like every once in a while and I just feel like it, like it was the hard way to do it just needed like Cassandra Clare was just adding angst to it when she could have just like made them have a happy ending or made it be bittersweet and stuff um and I know I was like kind of criticizing about like having everybody get this happy ending and stuff but like if she was going to do it that way then like there's an easier way to do it so um the plot line where Clary has a vision of herself dying and that's why she turns Jace down when he asks to marry her so I feel like it was kind of just like thrown in there and weird conflict made for no reason just to like add in a surprise because all we have is basically Clary seeing the Thule version of her dying and that's it and that's the whole reason why there's that drama between her and Jay. Certain things were unnecessary for the plot and also to further the plot and if you're gonna like I know, I, okay, like I'm not saying I didn't enjoy seeing all of the old characters from the Mortal Instruments in this book, um, or the series for that matter, but like I feel like if there's gonna be this much centered around them, then I feel like Sandra Clare should just make another book series about them, or at least another book. It took a lot away from the characters who were the main characters of this series. And so I also wish that Diana got to tell people that or at least Emma and Julian, that she is transgender on her own instead of like the Thule version of her telling them or like letting it slip because it wasn't a big deal to her. And I know she was about to go and tell them, but it's still her choice whether to tell them and it's still something that needs to come from her. And I feel like it was a weird thing where the other version of her mentioned it and they make a point to say that those people from the Thule universe are not carbon copies of the main characters that we know and love. And they're different people even though they're technically the same. And so for that version of Diana to spill the beans was like a little uh for me. And I feel like it was a weird thing for Cassandra Clare to do. So I think that's all for the eh and parts I didn't really like. And so now for questions that I have going forward. Okay, so I need an elaboration about the Parabatai curse. I still don't know how the bond is broken. We spend these three books setting up for this moment of like whether the curse is gonna happen or not and you like kind of see the effects of it happening but like all the effects were were like their runes were burning and then they turn into these fiery beasts and kill all the bad guys and like maybe a few 
good people here and there. There were way too many side plots. And the book wasn't small, so, like, Cassandra Clare should have spent a lot of the time worrying about this conflict instead of about setting up for other books, bringing in older characters, and just, t like, making up conflicts and plot lines that were unnecessary for the main plot. And so, like, going back to the demon with the Seraph Blades, why can it not be harmed by a Seraph Blade? And is it going to show up in other series, like the next two series? I want to know because that's a really interesting aspect to put in there and it's way too particular for it to be random. And then also, this is like just a random thought that I had. Did Horace know that the demon was a demon or did he think that it was Annabelle still? And because like when the demon pretended to be like that one shadow hunter and was at the meeting and then it came back to Horus, it transformed into Annabelle, not the demon itself. So like, did Horus know that he was conspiring with the demon? And also, why would a demon want to work with shadow hunters? What was this demon's goal? And I'm just like really confused about that and interested as to like why this happened. I don't know if it was supposed to be like a weird throw-in of a surprise. Annabelle isn't dead, but it's like, psych, it's not her, and again, it was just kind of unnecessary. And so also, uh, the first heir, I'm still really confused about that. Kit is related to the first heir, and the Herondale lineage is so confusing. Is that just a family trait? I want to know more about Kit's powers. And that's definitely probably going to be brought up in the series when it takes place, like focusing on him. And the younger characters, all we really see of Kit's powers are that he has this light that comes out of his hands and he like destroys the horses of the riders. And that's all. And then he passes out. Like, I'm wondering, does he have like a, like a weird combination of warlock and fairy powers? Because no shadow hunter blood w wins out, but I'm wondering what kind of powers he has and like what it's gonna have to do with the plot going forward. He's going to live with Jem and Tessa. Like I'm so excited. Like I wish he would stay with the Blackthorns because he's like grown to have a relationship with all of them. But that's so like interesting that plot line. He's gonna grow up with like a sibling. I'm like. Is it going to be a boy or a girl that Tessa has? Okay, so I think that's going to be it for my review of Queen of Air and Darkness. Of course, I still love this book, even though there were parts that I didn't enjoy as much as others. It's not my favorite Cassandra Clare book, but I still love it. Um, any of her books I read, I love. And so thank you guys for sitting with me, talking about this. Leave in the comments what you thought of the book if you've read it. Let me know if you agreed or disagreed on certain parts with me. And I would love to chat in the comments with you about it. Um, so thank you guys for watching. I'll see you guys next time. Bye! <laughs>